Today yeah. we have with us Claire Bond and Eleanor Bro. Sorry if I mispronounced any names. From Sarah Wigglesworth, Wigglesworth Architects, continuing our lecture series on public spaces. Sarah Wigglesworth Architects are highly acclaimed for their eco humanist approach, where social value and environmental design intersect. We are looking forward to hearing more about their educational projects today, and I think the WSA students will find this really inspirational. So thank you for accepting our invitation. Also, uh, please leave any questions you have in the chat box and we will try and get through them at the end of the lecture. Thank you. Okay, I'm just... Is that working? Can everyone see that? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Perfect. <clears throat> Um, so, um, I guess, thank you for inviting us um, to speak. Um, it's a real pleasure. Um, and I guess to introduce um, ourselves, I'm Eleanor Bruff. I'm an associate with Sarah Wigglesworth Architects. I've been with the practice for, I think, about 14 years, but I begin to lose track. <laughs> um, I guess I, I sort of work now at a, a sort of high level across uh, a number of our projects in different sectors. Um, and then Claire? Yeah, so I'm Claire Bond. I'm an architect for SWA and also I guess I wear a sort of another hat in the office, which is diversity champion. Um, so I think sort of being a small practice, we um, sort of do a lot of things al alongside our, our project work and um, overseeing our equality, diversity and inclusion committee is, oh God, sorry, is one of those things. That's all right, Eleanor. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I, I guess I joined the practice just over three years ago as a part two architectural assistant and then did my part three um, during the midst of COVID um, and have been qualified for just over a year now. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I guess sort of a quick intro to SWA and our approach. Um, Eleanor's going to sort of dive into this in a little bit more detail, but I guess the two key headlines really are people and place. Um, and I guess our little strap line is, we make people-centered places that are joyful, inventive, and resourceful. Um, so in that vein, we thought we'd start by introducing sort of our people and our place. <laughs> okay, so this is our office. This is where we work. So this is Stock Orchard Street. Um, some people may be familiar with it from the first series of Grand Designs. Sarah and her partner Jeremy built this um, sort of just over 20 years ago now and it's a mixed use so um, their house is on one side of the building and then our office is in this kind of quilted um, projection at the front here um, and I guess sort of the building embodies sort of the founding principles of, of our practice exploring themes of gender and domesticity and then, of course, sustainability. So it includes natural reclaimed or recycled materials. It's a landscape sort of context led approach. And more recently, we did a, a sort of 20 year celebration retrofit to improve the environmental performance of the building as well. And then people. So this is us. Uh, we're a small practice of 10 people at the moment. Um, and we've all got sort of a broad range of experience come from kind of a broad range of backgrounds. Uh, I guess our sort of style of working is very collaborative um, and I think that applies to both our project work but also this sort of non-project work that we we work on as well um, in the office. So Elna, over to you. <laughs> um, so we work across a, a kind of quite a broad range of sectors, um, education, housing, one of homes, civic and community and arts and workspace and our work extends into research and academia in parallel um, and in, in many ways we use um, each of our projects as a kind of an opportunity to research and develop ideas as well as deliver a kind of um, a built project or a kind of um, a design project for our, our clients. Um, there's a kind of golden thread that runs through everything which is an approach to economic, social and environmental sustainability and I think that sort of that really drives all of us and um, it, it kind of again comes back to the project that, that sort of founded the practice that, that Sarah talked about which is the house and office at Stock Orchard Street. 
Um, we've included this slide as a, to just give a kind of, I guess, a bit of a, a flavor and a cross section of our, our projects. Um, this, um, I guess, kind of running from along the top row, we've got Kingsgate Primary School, um, then Santa Magna Primary School, Bermondsey Cycle Store, Mellor Primary School, and then the bottom row, um, Ray Park Visitor Center, Siobhan Davis Dance Studios, the, the kind of garden space um, of the house and office at Stock Orchard Street, and then the, the kind of courtyard garden and, and seating at Haycroft Gardens, a one-off home in, in North London. I think, um, I mean, the thing that always sort of stands out to me is, is the diversity of the projects and the kind of site-specific response um, and people-specific response of each of these. And then the tactility of the materials um, and the kind of unique way in which actually quite everyday materials are used. And then I think, I think a real kind of desire from our point of view and from our clients' points of view um, to use natural materials and kind of honest materials and materials that sort of say something about the, the brief or the site um, or the kind of, uh, as an example, in relation to our educational buildings, the kind of pedagogy of, of the school um, client. So, um, as, a, as a practice, we, we sort of term our approach ecological humanism um, and see this as a sort of holistic environmental position, which, which aims to reconcile material and technical sustainability with social value. Um, and you can see here these sort of four aspects, environment and context, people and community, construction and process and learning and, and innovation, which are all kind of um, woven together to, um, to kind of guide our, our work and our approach to, to each project and, and each relationship we have with a, with a client or end user. Today, we're gonna to talk about um, four school projects, um, two which are completed and two which are in progress. Um, these projects demonstrate sort of different ways in which we've tailored a process, um, a people-facing pro process that sort of is very much focused on engaging in a bespoke way with our clients and our end users. Um, they're also projects which all respond to really, really kind of very different um, site constraints, um, both built um, and landscape um, settings. And I'm gonna start by talking about Mellor Primary School. Um, so Mellor Primary School um, was an extension to a 1990s built um, primary school in at the edge of the Peak District National Park. The brief was to um, extend the school to become one form entry. Um, so in order to do that, um, we were tasked with um, providing a new classroom, an SEN teaching room, a library, an extension to the hall, and uh, critically for this school, um, a store for all of their forest school activities. The school originally had approached us having seen um, some of the work on Stock Orchard Street and our education projects. They, they were looking for something different. They were looking for something which would be ecologically sustainable, um, which would um, really kind of understand and encompass their forest school program and allow that to grow. Um, and, and something which they could work collaboratively with us on through the design stages, but also the construction and delivery. They had, they had become um, a, a single academy um, with their own sort of set of trustees with the sort of, I guess, one of the purposes being that they could have a little bit of autonomy from the local authority to enable them to do something different and to do something really exemplar with their building project. The, the existing 1990s school, um, you can sort of see here a row of kind of two double pitch roofs um, orientated north south would remain fully operational throughout the construction phase. Um, this is something we, we deal with fairly often on school projects and it's, it's a real challenge and it's a real challenge in terms of how do you keep the school operating safely um, without too much disruption to the kind of the, the teaching um, and the play. Um, and this, this school, we kind of, we looked at sort of locating the new building to the north of the school, to the rear, to allow um, the, the front entrance to be unobstructed throughout construction and for a dedicated site access. And you can see that kind of blue dotted line 
kind of coming around to the side. Um, this constraint in turn offered us the kind of um, the opportunity to locate the new building um, in to the rear in um, in a sort of underutilized um, area of the landscape. The, the school have a kind of quite amazing landscape setting, lots of um, sports pitches, but also this kind of woodland, which extends down into a woodland dell that they use for forest school activities. But at the rear, the, the access to the landscape is quite poor. Um, it's not well used. Um, and so this kind of for us, we felt was a real opportunity to open up new connections into the landscape and really, I think, really enhance the, the way in which this new building could um, could develop the forest school program. Early on in the project, um, we, we kind of came up with this, this concept sketch, the idea of the, the sort of treetop classroom sort of stayed with the project and was a real guiding principle for both us and for our, our client. Um, very useful and sort of kind of as a cross check and a consolidation of, of what we're, we're trying to get to. Um, We'll, we often work with kind of uh, school clients who are not familiar with delivering buildings and not, not kind of um, used to looking at architectural drawings. So to test out ideas and communicate those to the, the school client, we developed a series of very simple card models looking at different spatial arrangements and massing, um, um, exploring how we might extend out. Um, you can see kind of there's quite a steep slope coming off the back of the building and then you've got the kind of tree belt running around. Um, so on the, on the left, there's a sort of series of, of option models. And on, on the right, the main image is an axo of the preferred scheme. So we've got the, the kind of pitched roofs continuing out um, across the, the slope, um, the hall extended. We've got a library sitting at the kind of pivot point between the existing school and the new extension. Um, and then sort of furthest out is um, a new classroom and that joins to the, the kind of the rest of the extension with a um, SEN room, ancillary accommodation like loos and cloakrooms, and then the forest um, school store. The slope of the hill means that the classroom kind of sits in, in the tree canopy. Um, so kind of the eye line is, is at canopy level. Um, and then I guess the other important thing for this client was um, providing lots of covered external space. So um, each of the sort of, well, there's two big cover decks, decks um, which essentially kind of almost double the teaching space we're providing. Um, the community build element um, and the idea of the client being engaged sort of throughout the process was a really key driver for this project. Um, Mellor are kind of, I think, quite a unique community. Everyone in the village is, is kind of able to offer something um, and is up for joining in in some capacity. And so we thought, well, let's really harness that. Um, and we, we thought quite hard with the, the head and with the governors and with the teachers as to what this community build element could be. Um, it, it wanted to be something that was enjoyable, which could um, involve all ages, um, which would contribute to the kind of educational aims of the school. Um, and I think in a sort of pragmatic side would be compatible with the, the kind of um, the, the standard building contract and not be adversely risky for a contractor to incorporate within their building. So we came to the idea of the habitat wall, which, um, which, face it, which sits on the west elevation of, um, of the school extension, west elevation of the classroom. We worked at kind of early stages with the children to design what might go in the habitat wall. So we've got some of their drawings here. Um, we, we took those drawings and we thought, okay, well, how do we make that into something that's, that's buildable? We, we had to get rid of some of the eagles, but um, we've hopefully carried, <laughs> carried through um, a number of their, their design um, ideas. And we developed essentially what is a, a giant kind of bookshelf, um, which is constructed as a, a, a rain screen, um, hung off split battens, so completely kind of separate from the watertight envelope. Um, we indicated the, the contents that could go into this wall. Um, and then we sort of we sort of left it to the school community to divvy up <laughs> which bits they wanted to do. Um, 
the base of the, the wall um, lower down tended to be the more interactive things like bug hotels or jars that kids collected and filled with local um, soils. Um, we had windows in this wall, wall which sort of um, looked through at um, straw bale insulation for that wall. Um, we, we then kind of put together a guide for how the school might um, fill the compartments and construct things. And with the head and his team, um, organized a, a series of weekend community build events um, and to be honest everyone just sort of found their own way and people were really great at just sort of developing ways far beyond what we'd put in our manual for, for filling the, the compartments. Um, you've got the, the SWA team kind of there in the, in the center um, with the, the school head I'm there somewhere under a hard hat. Um, and this is the finished um, wall um, with some bits still to be added. Um, the planting kind of took a bit of, of time to develop. Um, so I'm kind of now going to, I guess, put that back into the context of the building as a whole. Um, so here we have the external deck coming out of the classroom, which, which sits kind of in the tree canopy. We used um, a tree-like structure um, made of large glue lamb, which would support both the kind of GRP canopy roof, um, as well as the um, uh, structural cassettes that form the external walls to the building. So the larch is specified so it can go indoors and outdoors and the glue lamb frame kind of continues through. Um, so you can see it again there. And there you can see it kind of coming into the classroom. And the classroom was designed um, sort of I guess thinking about forming these different visual um, connections to the surrounding landscape so big generous doors opening onto the deck um, a sort of high level window that would show the continuity of the large glue lamb running through um, the kind of what, what the contractors call the bendy window which takes your eye from the tree canopy up into the sky and then a long thin slot a bit like a bird hide a bird, um, bird hide window with a desk in front, which sort of draws the eye directly into the canopy. Um, and then the materiality continues through into the library space that sits kind of between the new and existing buildings um, with, uh, with birch ply joinery and a display wall kind of forming the partition. Um, and then this is the, the kind of entrance into the forest store. So kind of you're able to come out of the forest store into a um, a sheltered space to gather before and after for our school sessions. The cladding for the building is um, Western Red Cedar shingles to the north and south elevations and Western Red Cedar boards, vertical boards to the east and west elevations. And here we've got some pictures of the school in use and I, I just, they've really sort of taken ownership of it and the, the spaces that kind of are there. I'd say I mean, particularly things like the, the welly store, the forest um, school store and, and the external deck have just really kind of opened up the, the kind of activities that they're able to, to do um, and the amount of time they're able to be out in the landscape. It rains quite a lot in the Peak District. So having that kind of covered external space um, and the, the place to hang your wellies up is really, really critical to how this school operates. Um, Okay, so um, moving on to Honley Nursery. Um, so having seen the project at Mellor, um, the, the clients for this project who are a family run um, nursery kind of operator based near Huddersfield came to us kind of with the brief um, to design a environmentally friendly um, landscape led early years facility in um, the village of Honley. They'd found a site um, which they were drawn to because of its sort of historic and landscape setting and they having having previously run built nurseries only in existing um, kind of repurposed buildings they thought right let's let's really sort of develop our vision and build something new um, and build something that is truly kind of embodying our ethos similar to Mella they had a strong forest school focus so um, the desire for something which kind of utilized natural materials, kind of greened materials, and had a lot of kind of connectivity to the landscape was really important to them. The site is located um, kind of in the center of a village called Homley, which is about 15 minutes from Huddersfield. Um, 
the north sort of edge of the site borders the River Holm um, and also fronts onto the Honley Village conservation area. Um, it has a, a sort of prior use as a council depot, but also um, as a kind of gas holder. So kind of various complexities around um, how to sort of safely reuse a, a brownfield site. Um, the gas holder actually sort of was was one of the things that had drawn the client to the site. It's a, it's a sort of, you can see a circular form to the south of the site there. And, and that is a sort of tall um, stone wall that's become kind of overgrown with planting over time. And it forms a really quite kind of unique landscape element. Um, you can see how overgrown it is here, image nine um, and image five kind of give you an idea of it, but it's sort of, I guess it's a bit like a natural amphitheater in, um, in the landscape. Um, and then other than that, the, there were a few kind of um, existing depot buildings um, of, of varying kind of quality on the site, but very much a kind of, um, I guess, a canvas for us to respond to and work closely with our clients to just sort of develop their vision. Um, we, we sort of started off um, similar to Mellor, they, they'd never done an architectural Kind of project before so working in models and sketches and, and sort of diagrams to try and establish um, the best kind of arrangement and response to the site always keeping the kind of relationship to the, the landscape as the focus um, we looked initially at whether we could retain the kind of um, uh, the, the building sitting along the boundary with the river home and for various reasons, um, sadly to do with car access and highways, it wasn't possible. Um, so the, the proposal ended up being a kind of new build um, design. Um, and this is a, a sort of sketch of, of our proposal. And the I guess the kind of, um, the design is sort of split almost into a sort of um, civic facing element, which is faced in stone and faces the conservation area. Um, and has a sort of form, more formal presence and is what um, kind of accommodates the, the main reception, the staff facilities, things like the kitchen, the things that sort of serve the childcare spaces. Um, whereas the south of the site um, is a kind of, I guess, more, more relaxed and natural um, timber clad building with a, a green roof canopy, planters on the roof um, and sort of ample openings into the landscape to provide the kind of free flow relationship that the client wanted for the childcare spaces. We've also got um, in the kind of sort of see the, the chunks sort of taken out of the site at the, the southern end, we provided an outdoor dining space. Um, again, the kind of idea that the kids want to be outside for as much time as possible in every day. Um, a ground floor plan here, so that kind of I guess shows in a little bit more detail the kind of split between the the kind of the frontage and the entrance and sort of um, I guess service spaces, and then um, the the two childcare spaces for the slightly like older children, which open out directly into the landscape. Um, but I guess one thing to say that, that the client was really keen that there was sort of lots of views through, lots of visual connections um, to the landscape. So from the point at which you enter the building, you're able to see all the way through um, the circulation space and the two to three year old space and into the, the landscape garden. Um, and then moving up to the first floor where we have the um, space for the under twos, which opens out on, onto a big kind of terrace um, with a kind of covered canopy to, um, to, to the edge of the building. Um, and then lots of staff and office space. Um, I think, I mean, we worked very closely with the client to, I guess, they, they've got a huge amount of experience in, in working with young children and, and running the, the kind of early years centers that they do. And I think that was a very kind of iterative and collaborative development of the, the, the plan and the, the sort of functional requirements of, um, of each of the spaces. Each of the childcare spaces also has a little welly area which um, allows um, kids to sort of change their shoes, plus a welly washing area in, un under the kind of canopies. Um, and then I think the section is useful in just conveying the kind of how dramatic the, the setting is and this sort of stone wall that kind of runs up the side and sort of encloses the landscape and protects it, making it feel a little bit like a kind of secret garden. Um, 
And then just finishing on some internal views, um, which convey both the idea of the kind of um, connection through to the landscape, but also the, um, the desire to use a sort of palette of natural um, materials and timber internally. So the building was designed to be constructed of cross laminated timber with the joinery elements constructed of birch ply. So on the left um, image, you've got the kind of view out from the, the under two space onto the roof deck. Um, then the entrance with the kind of, um, I guess, the series of frame views out to the garden. Um, and then one of the, the ground floor early years spaces. So I'm gonna stop sharing and pass over to Claire now. Great, thanks, Alna. Right, let's try this. Okay, and then can I go into full screen? Okay, perfect. <clears throat> so I guess that sort of moving on from more sort of rural landscape settings with Mellor and Honley, the two projects that I'm going to talk about are both based in London um, on slightly more urban sites. And I guess that a, a sort of another comparison point is the fact that with Mellor and with Honley, we were working sort of directly for the school um, or the nursery provider as our client. Whereas in both the projects I'm going to talk about now, um, our, our client, the person our appointment was with, wasn't actually directly the school. Um, so we've got a, a state school where we've got a local authority who's the client, and then we've also got a private school where a trust is our client. So um, slightly different dynamics and different challenges because um, we're still engaging with the school as the sort of end user. Um, but ultimately our client is, is not the school. <laughs> so it sort of adds a new level of complexity. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna start with Kingsgate Primary School. So this was a project that was completed in 2018 and it was um, to design an extension to existing Victorian buildings of Kingsgate Primary School. Um, and they were to include a multi-purpose studio library a new community entrance um, and a W accessible WC and storage. Um, so the schools in West Hampstead in North London, um, you can sort of see on this site plan here to the sort of the east um, and the south of the site. It's sort of quite residential um, and then to the north and to the west of the site, um, there's a lovely park, Kilburn Grange Park, um, and that sort of proximity to the park influenced a lot of the design decisions that were made um, throughout the project. You can sort of see in the blue box here, this is the, the wider primary school site. So there are some existing Victorian buildings um, on that site. And then there's a sort of smaller building here in red box, which ex was existing and um, which was sort of used for um, nursery um, age groups, so that's what these photos are of on the right, um, and that was sort of the location that was earmarked for for the extension. Oh, there we go. Okay, so the the client in this project was was the London Borough of Camden, and they had selected Kingsgate Primary School for expansion to help meet the needs of pupil spaces within the borough. Um, so the existing school, the existing school site here, um, didn't offer sufficient space. So that's why the extension was then sort of, that's why that came into fruition. Um, and it sort of it takes advantage of the opportunity for Camden to use this project as a way of demonstrating their commitment to exemplar learning environments as well. Um, so you can sort of see it up at the, the sort of top of the, the image here, these are the two sort of, I guess, main fingers of the existing building. And then sort of at the back here, this is this was our extension. So sort of right on the boundary line with Kilburn Grange Park. So the site was fairly constrained, as you will have seen. Um, so obviously we've got the boundary of the park, we've got those kind of residential streets, and then once again, the school needed to stay in operation. Um, so you'll see a continuous theme <laughs> with a lot of these school projects. Um, so the construction program had to work around the school timetable um, and we had to deliver the extension pretty quickly within a school holiday, summer school holiday. 
Um, so the solution in this instance was to use SIPs, so structurally insulated panels for the building fabric. So you can sort of see where those were with the sort of dark gray. Um, and then sort of where we've got the, the white walls, that's the, the existing building. Um, so the advantage of using SIPs was that they could be prepared off site and grained into place, which condensed the construction program quite considerably. And it also helped sort of minimize the number of deliveries to site, sort of bearing in mind that it was quite a residential area. So again, sort of as Eleanor alluded to, um, we try to use models where we can um, for sort of a number of reasons. You know, I think working in 3D um, and in sort of sketch model form is really helpful for us with the design development. Um, but it, it is also very useful to obviously communicate these ideas to people that aren't used to reading plans. So although, you know, our client was very familiar with delivering building projects. The, the, you know, the local authority obviously deliver a large number of, of education projects. The school themselves perhaps were less familiar. So that's where these sort of tools are, are particularly useful. Um, and I think you sort of can start to see ideas of materiality come through as well in some of these models, which then sort of were translated into, into the final design. So yeah, you can sort of see that it's sort of not dissimilar to Mellor actually, um, the sort of um, response to the existing pitch roofs um, on the existing building. And then sort of one of those pitches was, was sort of flipped, I guess, to maximize relationship with the, with the park and the green space. Okay, so yeah, this, this sort of picks up that sort of boundary line with, with the park. Um, and I guess it also is a, another demonstration of sort of the various different ways that we try to communicate our ideas um, sort of throughout the lifespan of a project. So the, the extension was designed to enhance the school's relationship with the adjacent park. And you can sort of see window locations sort of up in the, in the gable, but also kind of these corner details as well were designed to sort of really match, maximize views um, and create this kind of much more active frontage park side. And there was sort of also, I guess, thinking about future proofing um, consideration given to a sort of future community access points that might be able to be provided from the, the side of the park. And I guess, you know, there's, there's sort of lots of complexities when it comes to safeguarding and secure lines when you're working with school projects. So um, these things aren't necessarily um, always easiest to bring to fruition, but I think sort of part of our role is um, making sure that they could be facilitated in the future um, should the client sort of want to do that or should the community be using these spaces much more. Um, and I guess it's worth saying that there were two established community groups sort of either side of the site. Um, so, you know, the community linked to this, this school is, is, is fairly significant. Okay, so these images sort of, I guess, are a, a slightly different form of engagement. So this is sort of perhaps less for the, the pupils that are attending the school and more for the, the client who's sort of, um, who's sort of commissioning the project. And, and really, it's just sort of to communicate the idea that, you know, using natural materials, they, they do weather. Um, you know, there is a change over the period, period of time. And, you know, even on the photos that you, you'll see we've had taken of the project, they're sort of quite early on after the project is completed and, and aren't truly reflective of, of the colour that the timber will be after, you know, a year's time. So you can see kind of us trying to demonstrate the, the change over time to kind of the, the more naturally weathered timber. So yeah, this is this is the sort of the finished project. Um, this is sort of, a, I guess, a, a real special moment within the scheme where we've got this sort of really lovely big corner window um, and there's benching on the inside. This is part of the library space, sort of an internal reading nook. But then the benching, I guess, is also extended externally um, and creates this, this sort of lovely uh, moment for independent reading but also kind of opens up the opportunity for outdoor learning as well um, and sort of bringing more pupils outside um, sort of I guess building on some of those forest school principles um, and I think what we find especially working on projects with constrained budgets is that it's really helpful to kind of nail down sort of early on 
in the briefing stage what the kind of the key special moments might be within a project I'm really trying to safeguard those um, sort of throughout the project lifespan and I think this is sort of a, a really successful example of, of where that really special moment has, has been sort of protected. Um, so yeah here's some some more detailed photos of the, the facade so it's a treated timber cladding um, and it's sort of I guess reflective of the natural setting of the park um, and establishes a distinctive character of the extension as well in comparison to the existing building and sort of by having these slightly um, projecting um, parts of the cladding uh, the the light is sort of picked up and and is you know sh different shadows are created throughout the the school day which sort of adds a really lo lovely kind of level of of interest for the for the pupils as well so yeah i guess picking up on kind of the idea of contrasting with the existing building um you know the timber cladding helps to create a clear distinction between the existing school which you can see is the brick building here um and and the new addition behind and the sort of key features of the, the existing building, as you've seen in kind of the 3D models and, and this image, you know, the, the pitch roofs, the dormer, pop-up dormer windows, um, gable elevations, they've all been sort of reinterpreted in the form and scale of the extension to sit comfortably um, in the context of the wider school. And then sort of moving inside, I guess the, the, the new internal spaces try to draw on daylight qualities and proportions of the existing building to maximize the amount of natural light. So this image shows the sort of existing hall on the right hand side with the kind of more ornate truss detailing um, and the more ornate window detailing. And then you can see our sort of new addition, um, which sort of reflects those geometries um, on, on the left hand side. And internally, I guess the, the plywood panels in this instance are used to sort of not only unite those two spaces as one, but it also helps to set a datum height in those big lofty spaces that's sort of perhaps a little bit more reflective of the scale of the, the children that are going to be in that space. Um, and it also adds a more robust finish at that low level where there is going to be more bashing about and furniture is going to be moved and, you know, it's, it sort of adds to that robustness of what we do, which, which is a really big factor for schools when maintenance costs are being sort of considered within the life cycle of a project. And then this is the, the library space. So you can see those kind of, you know, those nice high um, ceiling heights are are sort of carried on through, which creates a lovely feeling of spaciousness. And it means that daylight can enter from multiple directions. So um, you get those kind of views of the sky and the treetops above from the, the high level windows, but then you also get that sort of active window um, at playground level as well. Um, and obviously we've been able to kind of integrate the window seats on the low level windows as well, um, and continue to use natural materials to sort of help create a calm, learning environment um, and I think sort of one thing which is worth just mentioning as well before I move on to the next project is the sort of success of the project sort of resting on the ambitious client and school which had a clear you know they had a clear vision for what they wanted to achieve um, and I think that's sort of reflective in those earlier projects that Eleanor spoke about as well um, and we sort of collaborated on this project with um, a company called Architects Collaborative who had done a lot of um, sort of other works on the school site so they were they had built up good relationships with the with the school already um, and sort of using their knowledge of the site and the stakeholders we were able to develop a sort of complementary working relationship to ensure that the client's objectives were reflected in the process and then also in this this final final project so that's Kingsgate and finally, I'm going to talk about a project that's sort of currently on the drawing board, uh, metaphorically. <laughs> um, so this is a project that's sort of live in the office at the moment. Um, it's a master plan scale rationalisation study of a primary school in North London um, to increase usable space and also help future proof the school. Um, and I guess sort of when we talk about future proofing not only are we talking about possible increase in pupil numbers in the future we're also capturing kind of spatial organization quality of materials and maintenance needs changes in pedagogy and the curriculum um, and also reducing the school's impact on the planet through an embedded sustainability strategy as well 
So the school's split across two buildings, which is sort of another added complexity. Um, so you can see here on the section, um, and the, the whole team, you know, thankfully, <laughs> was very keen that a retro first approach was taken, um, rather than sort of trying to focus on sort of adding in that existing, sorry, sort of adding to the existing space by building in the, the sort of much loved playground areas. Um, so the, the focus of this project really is sort of internal spaces, internal reconfiguration and a, a loft extension, um, as well as kind of upgrading the landscape, um, all under this umbrella of this kind of embedded sustainability strategy that this will be able to deliver long term. So it was sort of super important in this instance, because we obviously had our, our sort of two different types of client, I guess, um, that we are involved as early as possible to help guide the brief. So the, the school is a trust owned junior school. So our client is the trust, but obviously our end user and kind of key stakeholder is the school themselves and input from both the school and the trust um, and their, their priorities were sometimes different. So, you know, that had to be factored into kind of where we were focusing our attention. So we sort of did a, an option study quite early on, which helped them to refine the brief. Um, so I think what sort of came out of that was a real desire to have a much bigger hall space, a sort of flexible multi-use hall, which they didn't have. Um, and also kind of really make their specialist subject areas sing. Um, so they, as well as kind of traditional form classrooms, they also have, um, sort of dedicated specialist spaces as well. So um, things like music department, um, art, they also wanted to really push their STEM um, offering within their curriculum as well. So here's a, a site plan for you. So um, the school, as I say, is split across two buildings that are across the road from each other. Uh, it's a conservation area and the um, the sort of surrounding buildings, it's, it's sort of quite, well, it's very residential. There are a few buildings that have sort of been converted like, like these have, but um, majority of them are, are still in use as, as residential sort of villa type houses, I guess, um, with kind of these big, large gardens, um, which kind of work to the school's advantage because they get these kind of lovely big playgrounds, which you can see at the rear, which is sort of quite rare in a sort of um, an urban school setting. Um, I think one of the, the, the big problems was a, is a sort of big disconnect between these two buildings at the moment. The uses are kind of unclear. The main entrance is quite unclear. Um, the forecourt to number five is predominantly used for kind of quite random parking. There's bins. Um, all of these green arrows kind of indicate different kind of doors or access points, um, which can be quite confusing. Um, and sort of, I guess, this slightly darker space to the front of number 12 here is a dedicated um, early years play space. Um, but that sort of uses the main entrance to the school um, or what would have been designed as the main entrance. So actually, in practice, the main entrance is down this kind of tiny little side alley here. So um, quite a lot to think about in terms of the access and entrance sequence as well with this building. Um, so kind of building on our engagement with um, staff, with senior leadership team and kind of subject leads, we also ran engagement sessions with the pupils as well, um, which was really, really fun. Um, it was a really ambitious engagement process. We engaged with pretty much the whole school. So over 200 girls in one afternoon, and we sort of collaborated with the client and with the landscape architects on, on delivering that. Um, so I think for us, the, you know, the, the engagement was really valuable tool, not just to kind of um, get the, the girls insight into what they like and don't like about their spaces and what they would like to see in their school, but it also helps to sort of spark um, ambition, uh, spark interest in the built environment, um, as well as sort of um, helping with um, keeping enthusiasm high, you know, the reality of it is, is that we're probably going to be delivering this project over, you know, four years. 
because of the scale of it and the fact that the school needs to stay in operation. So um, kind of keeping interest high, keeping the girls excited and, and sort of not seeing that as a disruption is kind of really a critical part of the engagement as well. So this sort of summarizes some of those engagement sessions. So some of the, the kind of key words that were coming out of our conversations with the girls about their internal spaces and what they'd like to see in them. And then I guess kind of taking um, those words and kind of translating them into key kind of briefing points that we can keep referring back to within the project. So natural sustainable materials, encouraging curiosity, responding to context and, and link to landscape. And I think sort of, yeah, focusing on that link to landscape in the first instance, these are some of the engagement sheets that came out of the, the landscaping engagement sessions and what the girls wanted from their playground. Um, you can't quite see it here, but I think this was my favourite. It was the Ritz Bug Hotel. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to deliver that for them. <laughs> um, yeah, there's sort of lots of bits and bobs going on with this project, but I'm going to try and sort of focus in on, on a couple of the key moves. So I'll start with the landscaping and I'll work inwards. So this is uh, a landscape master plan, which was drawn up by BD Landscape Architects, who we're working with on the project. Um, and I think the sort of main approach in the playgrounds to the rear is sort of ways of retaining equipment wherever possible, um, increasing connections to teaching spaces and allowing for outdoor learning and providing a variety of play spaces. So looking at the rear of number five, for example, there's a sort of forest woodland school type setup um, to the far end of the playground. They've got some larger play equipment. There's open space where the girls can run around. And then we're also looking at how we can sort of include a sort of edible teaching garden, which would have direct access to their new sort of STEM lab, uh, their science and DT space. So how we can sort of try and encourage a bit more outdoor learning and some of those things that we've learned from our forest school projects. Um, and then also kind of, I guess, feeding into the sustainability strategy or practical things like thinking about where air source heat pumps are going to go. Um, so number five the gas boilers are coming to the end of their life and rather than put new gas boilers in a, a big strategic move has been to look at installing air source heat pumps as part of this immediate project so that's that's sort of quite challenging in terms of space and the space that's required for air source heat pumps um whether that's purely external or also using some internal space which we have explored as an option with our sustainability consultant and then in this context balancing the acoustic implications of that um, with the fact that you've got you know neighboring residential buildings in quite close proximity um, so that's been sort of another layer that we we've, we've needed to to factor in and then i guess sort of over at the forecourt this was our our big moment i guess to kind of really demonstrate the school's ethos and their commitment to sustainability. Um, and I'm gonna sort of move on to that now. So this is a photo of the existing. So you can see the existing sort of um, Queen Anne sort of style building, sort of probably 1880s style um, villa. And at the moment, the forecourt is just full of barriers, you know, bins, car parking, big planter right where the entrance is. And there is a ramp um, access here. Um, and that's sort of normally blocked off by cars and is, is sort of pretty difficult to use. Um, and there's sort of no delineation really of what's public and what's private space um, on, on the frontage. Parents have to wait on the street. You know, it's, it's not sort of giving a great first impression. Um, so we've been looking at sort of, again, sort of working with BD Landscape Architects to look at a really clear route up to the entrance, framing that with some street trees, which are reflective of kind of the context of the conservation area, um, and including a welcome garden for parents to wait. This could also be used for sort of outdoor teaching. It really makes sure that that accessible entrance is maintained clear as well. Um, and it provides us with an opportunity to really up the biodiversity um, on the site as well. And then on the other side, we've kind of got a slightly more service led space. So um, we do need a space for one car in case of a sort of emergency situation. Um, but, you know, we've been able to essentially bring all of the car parking off the site, which is fantastic and just prioritize sustainable transport modes like cycle storage and, and scooter storage as well. 
And then similarly over at number 12, you can sort of see some of the existing images, kind of quite unloved early years foundation stage play area, quite bog standard storage for bikes and scooters. And then this was the, the alleyway down the side where the main entrance to the school was. So we've sort of done a big flip really. The early years now have a new entrance um, and a new play space. And that means we can sort of um, reinstate the main entrance to, to the main building, um, which sort of helps to improve the connection back to number five. Um, also with the addition of the two street trees, which mirror that, um, that kind of entrance sequence. And then again, a sort of um, a, a welcome garden with, with scooter storage. Um, and this sort of sums that up really. Number five is definitely the more public facing space. Um, it's where the main reception is, it's where the specialist spaces are going. Number 12, much more private. So that's sort of been reflected in those four courts. So yeah, just touching on some plans. Um, the bottom here is existing and the top here is the proposed. Um, dark green is sort of traditional form classrooms and pale pink is sort of specialist subjects. So you can see at the moment it's pretty mixed, but we're sort of making number 12 much more um, private, focusing on those form classrooms um, and also looking at a roof extension. So that's where we're able to kind of future-proof the school, but not kind of compromise on their playground spaces. So looked at kind of building two new classrooms up in the loft. And this is sort of, I guess, summarizing some of the key principles that are going into that, um, that classroom design. And these are sort of embedded, I guess, not just in new classrooms, but in the retrofit of sort of all of the classrooms throughout the school. So hopefully you'll kind of see things in here from other built projects of ours. So the use of natural materials, um, you know, we're also looking at clever storage solutions and in this instance where there's sort of less wall space because of the roof pitch, how we might be able to finish those cupboards with magnetic finish, whiteboard finish, um, so they actually become kind of multi multifaceted in their use um, and sort of putting in new dormers that, that mean we can, can create these kind of dedicated quiet spaces, these reading nooks. Um, you know, for, for a different style of, of learning and teaching, um, you know, natural light, views to the sky, views out to the treetops, um, and also kind of using the ceiling a bit more, you know, how can we maximise the ceiling for hanging displays, and we looked at sort of designing a grid system which um, would be installed to the acoustic panelling, which would mean that, you know, there could be um, slightly more creative displays within the classroom space. And this just shows that number 12 building. And I've just popped this visual in just so you can see the sort of the, the impact that we would be having with the, the loft extension. So very minimal <laughs> in the conservation area. So you can see there's sort of the small window up at the front here um, to bring that kind of gable into use as the reading space. And then this is the infill here. So we've been exploring kind of natural materials, timber shingles, um, sort of reflective of um, the sort of clay tiles that are used reg sort of regularly within the area. Um, so again, kind of building on that Kingsgate idea of sort of differentiating between the existing and the, and the new. And then over at number five, kind of similar principles, you can see the existing plans at the bottom, very higgledy-piggledy with kind of staff spaces in the gray, form teaching spaces in green, and then kind of some specialist space in pink. And we've tried to really make this the kind of the specialist building, the exciting building that's the public facing space. And the main move really is sort of putting this dining main sort of dining hall on the ground floor, um, much larger than obviously the little one they've got at the moment, um, and sort of giving each floor a specialist subject to kind of really embed those within the curriculum. So STEM and DT on the lower ground floor with the connection to outside, the multi-use dining hall with the connection to the library, um, art spaces and then music up on the up on the top floor and then I've just sort of included this as the last slide really this is um, a part of the project which isn't being progressed for kind of a, a number of reasons um, but this was sort of looking at the idea of building a separate staircase um, externally at the rear of number five and I think you know we just wanted to include this as as um, as a way of sort of kind of indicating that, you know, there are lots of aspects of projects that don't get built for various reasons. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that they're kind of not valuable learning tools. And I think for us, you know, our interests very much are, you know, using innovative, sustainable materials as one of those. And this was a, a moment for us to really kind of get our teeth into um, a new material. So we did a lot of work on hempcrete and the design was being developed as, as a hempcrete structure. Um, and although, you know, this part of the project might not come to fruition, it's still been sort of um, a really valuable exercise in kind of expanding our knowledge bank um, in, within the office. Um, so yeah, that's sort of South Hampstead. Um, it's sort of all over the place at the moment in terms of project stage. We've got a planning application in, another planning application which is going in, um, some works were delivered on site last summer. We're doing stage four design on some of it. So, you know, these, these school projects are, are incredibly complex um, and, and the phasing is, is a big part of them. So um, apologies if that was a bit all over the place as well. <laughs> um, I guess the nature of, of the work. Um, so yeah, just to summarize, Eleanor, I don't know if you wanna pick up some of these points. Yeah, um, thank you, Claire, that was great. Um, we we thought we'd sort of I guess reflect a little bit on on what we've shown you um with a few kind of key points um so I mean I guess one thing is to say that the process is as important as the completed project and I think we work really hard to think about how the process can be made enjoyable engaging and manageable for the client and end users I think key to to kind of how we work is how we can kind of give ownership of the project to, to our clients um, and build confidence in our kind of inexperienced clients. Um, the process will inevitably be stressful at points. There's a lot of decisions to be made. There's a lot to happen. Things are expensive. Um, budgets are difficult to manage. But I think kind of, I guess, working through the process, understanding your client and kind of iterating um, and, and tailoring your process to, to kind of make it enjoyable um, is, is really key. Uh, yeah, so sort of using creative tools to involve end users of all ages and abilities in the design process will stimulate great ideas and contribute to learning. Um, and I think that's particularly sort of prevalent in Mella and in um, the, the school in the primary school in North London. Um, you know, the, as I say, that the engagement is sort of a, a multi-pronged attack in a way, you know, it can, it can sort of stimulate ideas for us, it can help engage whoever we're, we're sort of doing the workshop with in um, the built environment and the processes that go on in kind of um, delivering a project. Um, and I think, you know, for example, with South Hampstead, you know, we wanted to make sure we had student engagement and also staff engagement. And I think part of the challenge is working out who's going to react well to what and tailoring your engagement to, to suit that. And that's where kind of lots of different forms of representation can be incredibly useful. So kind of having lots of skills, you know, in, in your back pocket um, in terms of representation to make sure that you, you're communicating um, effectively with with those different end users of all ages um, ages and abilities um, and then I guess integrating community build and, and local supply chains can, can really help develop skills and give stakeholders ownership of their project um, but I think there's a kind of caveat to that and I think it's it's really important to gauge the the appetite and capacity for community build and, and co-design early on and tailor the project to suit Mello were really up for it um, but when we explored the option of self-built um, round earth foundations they were less up for it because actually that's a kind of long grueling process um, with no sort of rewarding visual thing at the end of it so I think it's kind of um, it's important to kind of get it right and judge it right for the client um, I think in in our kind of involvement um, in terms of um, advising on procurement, um, we think it's really important to sort of have a procurement process that, that makes um, it accessible to local suppliers, um, local contractors, um, to kind of keep skills and build skills in the community and contribute to the wider social value of the project. Yeah, and then using natural renewable materials is more sustainable sustainable and ensures the building resonates with the landscape setting so again I think you know there's 
hopefully by showing some sort of more traditionally rural or landscape led schemes alongside some ur more urban schemes, you know, hopefully there's still that thread of kind of a landscape led approach. Um, I think, you know, with South Hampstead, for example, with the, the um, North London Primary School, um, you know, with that stair, for example, we were exploring timber structures, but because it was going to be a fire stair, you know, that immediately was a high risk item that then meant that timber, which might sort of traditionally be our natural renewable go to material, all of a sudden was was less appealing to the client. And that's where, you know, it was, you know, the, the opportunity to explore a, a slightly different approach with with the hempcrete hempcrete that still sort of you know had that natural renewable um you know credential but was actually it's incredible for fire it's you know it's it's and that was something we learned kind of through through that process um and then yeah finally Elna. <laughs> so I guess yeah inspiration comes in all shapes and sizes um as a, as a team, we really thrive off multidisciplinary collaboration. We, we're always looking to kind of engage beyond the world of architecture. Um, I think this is kind of in our consultant partners. Um, I think we, we recently had an artist in residence in the practice who really encouraged us to kind of look at the way we work and the, the projects that we do in a completely kind of new way. Um, we, we do a lot of mentoring, we, we run various workshops, project related and non-project workshops and all of these things kind of, they give us inspiration and they, they kind of help us to kind of get perspective on, on what we do and think beyond the kind of um, perhaps the conventional solution to a, a sort of architectural problem. Um, yeah, so we're always looking for ways to reflect on our work and bring a new perspective to our approach. And I guess that's kind of one of the reasons why we quite enjoy doing talks like this. <laughs> yeah. Um, Great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, that was really, really interesting. Um, and you can really see how that eco-humanist approach comes through in all of those different projects. Um, I, I think... We'll hopefully have a couple of questions if that's all right with you. So if yeah, of course. people still want to leave questions in the chat, um, I'll start with my question, um, which is I've, I really like how you sort of safeguard these moments um, early in the design process, like you protect them through design process. So for example, that seat on, out, on the outside window in Kingsgate, I thought that was really nice. How do you sort of come up with these? Are these something fueled by the, the community engagement or is it something, um, yeah, like that just comes from the design process and context? Shall I take that one? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, this is a challenge that we're currently facing on that last project I spoke about. Um, you know, often these projects start with really fantastic ambition which is great you know you, that's how you want a project to start um, but you know be, through the project process through the various constraints you know particularly working with operational schools um, often with tight budgets you know there is, you do run the risk of actually um, losing the things that make that special um, so you know one of the, the things we're going through at the moment is you know running these workshops with staff at the school to reflect on the pupil engagement um, to essentially highlight where the key areas are with the school where we can add value. So if later down the line, we get to a point which hopefully we won't, but if we get to a point where we're unable to deliver on something for one of the various reasons, you know, whether that is program, phasing, um, budget, you know, the, the key areas are, are highlighted. So, for example, in this project, that will be the hall space, the main hall space and moments, I think, within the specialist spaces. So possibly library spaces um, within that um, and and sort of, I guess, sort of in a way, the, the, the bits that are going to make that that building or that space really sing. Um, so I think it, it is done through engagement. It has to be done through engagement and, and sort of, I guess, a really robust briefing process where 
those key points can be pulled out. So for example, us pulling out those kind of link to landscape, natural sustainable materials. So we, we can then go back to, you know, DTMs, design team meetings, however many months down the line or a year down the line and say, no, look, this was a really important part of the brief. This is something we need to protect. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and also like when, when do you, tend to introduce the community engagement in the projects to sort of start thinking about these moments? Like, um, is it something you do at the very start or is it continuous and you you get different opinions from pe different people on the project at different times? I, I mean, I guess it, it varies from project to project. I think um, we usually try and um, sort of, I guess, introduce an, an, an element of engagement really quite early on um, and then kind of, I guess, develop that and have um, sort of different types of engagement as the design develops, um, because I think there's sort of different types of detail that people can contribute to. Um, but yeah, I think, I think starting early in the process so that you kind of, you're not sort of presenting preconceived ideas to your your stakeholders but you're actually kind of you're sort of you're opening it up and then yeah. you're kind of you're consolidating that and then presenting that back and getting more feedback so it's a sort of it, it's sort of woven into the the process um, yeah. I think just to add on that as well I think if you leave it too late you end up doing abortive work yourself so it's in mm. it's in the architect's best interest to be engaging early on um, yeah. You know, otherwise you could have ser serious impacts on program costs, all those mm. things that we talk about. Um, you know, if if something's being flagged very late on in the day because you've not asked the right question. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, we've got um, a question from Elizabeth, and that is, how does site accessibility affect the design? For example, the more rural areas will have limited routes to transport materials and accommodate large vehicles. How do you work around that in your design process? Uh, I can take that one. So I guess um, both Mella and Kingsgate um, used modular off-site components, which are big. And so the kind of, um, I guess the, the kind of site access and the construction sort of site management has to be quite carefully thought through. Um, the, I guess in Mela, the there's a benefit in using relatively local subcontractors. So things are not having to travel very far. People understand the road networks um, and sort of the discussions around how to get things to site and the scale of the module can happen quite early on. I think they're kind of there are decisions around whether to use certain types of sort of off-site um, components that that need to be made quite early in the design process because they'll affect the kind of what's possible in terms of the form and the layout. Um, and I think considerations over craneage, um, width of roads, the the size of the the site compound, or any other constraints, trees surrounding buildings will help inform that. I think Kingsgate is an interesting one because as, as Claire kind of illustrated, the, the new building um, is sort of located amongst a kind of quite a built up school um, site with an operational playground in, but the, the client had decided before our involvement that they wanted to use the offsite um, SIP product. Um, and I think kind of perhaps by the end of the process um, on reflection, building it using a traditional timber framing might have been just as easy given the, the site constraints and the limited sort of zones for craneage um, of large materials. Another thing which is I guess kind of anecdotal, um, the, the, the kind of the SIP manufacturer actually forgot to put the roof through the factory so the roof never turned up on site and they ended up building it traditionally. And I think that was the thing that made everyone kind of think, well, why didn't we just build this out of traditional timber frame in the first place? Um, but yeah, it's, it's sort of one of those things that's it's part of the, the design process. And I'd say, yeah, it's something that, that needs to be considered early on. Yeah, that, 
that makes good sense uh as well thank you um is there any more questions um Do you have any advice? Is anyone else struggling? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, sorry, I don't think we can quite hear you. Would you mind typing a question in the chat and then I can read it out? Is that Iona struggling with uh, signal? Oh, looks like she's frozen. <laughs> yeah the the troubles of online <laughs> yeah <laughs> at least she wasn't in a mid crit <laughs> yeah <laughs> um does anyone else have any questions while waiting for owner Oh, she's gone. Oh, fuck. Wait. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, no, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can quickly text her to see if she wants to. <laughs> There's a lot of pressure going on to this question now. I know. Isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I, think really I, think, <laughs> I don't think she's going to be able to rejoin, unfortunately. Uh, um, but that's all right. I think we'll we'll probably end it there. No one else. Oh wait, she's got a question. Um, she's got a question on working with extensions. Um, because her project is an extension this semester. Um, so I'm reading this as it's being typed out. So it's always <laughs> <in a> single. <laughs> um, While we wait so for that one to come in, then basically, do you, okay. do you have any advice on working with extensions? Um, uh, but yeah. Um, it's a I big guess question. <laughs> it is a big question. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think, I think Claire's presentation sort of illustrated how important it is to kind of really understand your existing building um, before settling on how much or where you might want to extend. So yeah. kind of the retro first approach. I think, I think the Mella project kind of illustrates how something which actually is not a particularly big extension um, through the way it relates to the sort of existing building and surrounding landscape can do much more. So I, I think the kind of the simple things just in terms of building and site analysis um, and testing out some options. Yeah, I think I would just echo the sort of um, I guess it's it's sometimes more challenging with a university brief, but you know, really questioning how much you do need to build. You know, when when we started this North London Primary School project, the, there had been a previous architect that had looked at the scheme and tried to accommodate expansion, and they built two really big extensions in each of the playgrounds. You know, so not only is that kind of getting rid of this valuable playground space you know green space biodiversity it's also increasing kind of you know operational carbon embodied carbon mm. it's sort of it's a really unsustainable approach and i think you know one of the one of the things that we're finding not just in our education work but across all of our sectors at the moment is that you know there's a big emphasis on retrofit you know we have a lot of retrofit projects in the office mm. and i think that's a a sort of conscious decision in terms of our sort of emerging approach to the climate emergency and you know it does raise the question you know what's the role of the architect and that's something we sort of debate in the office you know what's the role of us moving forward when actually the best thing you can do is not build um and yeah sorry Elna, you no it's fine you um, no no I think that's a really good point and I was sort of thinking that I was going to kind of reference another one of projects, not one that's in this presentation, but um, Siobhan Davies Dance Studios 
which um, provides a kind of a series of alterations and extensions to an existing building. And I think one of the things that really is really rich about that project and perhaps does kind of reinforce the role of the architect is that the kind of combination of the sort of the traces of history that are left. So there's sort of, I guess, imprints of where the previous stair ran up the building, yeah. but combined with the sort of the kind of new purpose built bits that are kind of are additions is really it works really really well so i think um yeah definitely kind of looking at what you can get out of the existing building first um and and sort of yeah trying to kind of keep some of the kind of the richness of what might exist um, thank you Yeah, I think that's a really nice point as well, like um, just preserving the history because so much has already happened in those buildings. Like it would be such a shame to to just get rid of it and just forget about it. Like I think, yeah, no, because it always serves as like a memory having those buildings there. So that's yeah. quite nice. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, I think that's our last question. So thank you very much. That was really interesting. And yeah, I've certainly got a lot to uh, think about and take into my own design projects. Like I think those sort of protected moments, which um, which you, you keep through your design process is gonna stick with me. So thank you for that. Great, <laughs> well, good luck with the yeah. remainder of your studies. Um, really good luck um, and yeah thank you again for inviting us to speak yeah it was great to meet you thank you very much for coming thank you yeah. and good luck with the upcoming deadline yeah yeah <laughs> yeah we'll be we'll be busy for the rest of the week so yeah. <laughs> but no it's it's good so thank you very much Brilliant. great bye -bye. thanks very much guys bye, bye.